Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Information Literacy. My name is Dr. Jim Lotek, and I'm going to be your instructor for this class. Uh, keep in mind that this is the online version of the class, the in-person class that most of you would prefer, unfortunately, has been put off because of the uh, C-virus. Um, hopefully, that'll revert later. Um, information literacy, when it's done right, it's probably the most important class you're ever going to take in a college environment. Um, what it was designed to do is created by librarians to help people do academic research. Uh, the reason was before there was the Google and all these electronic media to search, people actually had textbooks and journals that they physically had to go to get to find research. The result was that librarians were the most important person in any institution because they can save literally hundreds of hours of research getting you to the proper kind of material to do your research. And what happened was, in the 70s and the 80s, the librarians kind of saw what was happening with the online environment and the CDs that came out that had uh, different uh, academic literature on it. And they said, hey, wait a minute, we're not going to be here to help people find the correct kind of information. And that's why they created the information literacy class. So really, the purpose of information literacy is to help you do scientific resources using proper scientific sources themselves that are, have high uh, credibility. Instead, you know, with today's environment, you see so much stuff on Google, Wikipedia, and the truth is most of that is strictly B BS. You can't trust it. Um, now, what's happened was, is again, the course was designed for scientific focus, but because this course online was written by humanities experts, they've expanded that into the political kind of realm and just generalized web search, which uh, there's some, some benefits to that too. So keep in mind, I cannot control the content of the online course, um, but I will try to teach you behind the scenes what it's supposed to do, and hopefully I'll, I'll get you to a better place. Um, some in, a general advice on online courses is it warranted, I think, at this point. Um, keep in mind that online courses, I have a lot of experience in online courses. Um, they're self-paced generally. Uh, usually the instruct, instruction is always based on predetermined content, which means instructors don't usually go in and create videos for stuff because they're not really allowed to. They are told you have to teach from this and everybody has to get the same thing. Um, now, with the virus and stuff with the high schoolers, you see more people make uh, some of this content, which is a good thing, but that's not normal. So usually, it's, it's an online course is a self-instruction type thing. So you have to go in at whenever it's convenient for you and do as much as you can. Um, and they use discussions as a learning tool. So what happens in an online course, you have a fixed amount of stuff that you have to read and go through, digest. There might be some quizzes along the way and assignments. And then you will discuss those with your peers. Your peers are usually gonna ha have responses to your different observations, usually the, to a specific question. And your instructor will moderate those discussions, those discussions to try to help you get to, again, a better place to, to teach you some stuff. So that's where the teachers are going. Um, <clears throat> but the problem is, is when you're dealing with people, discussions don't always go as well as, well as they should. Because a discussion is supposed to be an academic discussion. It's not supposed to be a folksy discussion. Because the truth is, in, in an online class, nobody really cares. Right? They're out here looking for specific information. And what tends to happen is everybody is overly nice to each other, which means they don't criticize each other properly. And, and for an academic to be successful, criticism is the best gift that you can get. Uh, and when some people hear criticism or challenge an idea or a misconception, they tend to freak out and you see like spears starting to sh throw in, in the discussion section. So my, my point here is in a discussion, take everything with a grain of salt. Don't think that people are trying to hurt you, they're just trying to express that you may have differences of opinion with somebody else, and that is normal. Um, generally, those social Im limitations are probably one of the biggest problems of an online course. Professors usually have to do a lot of work behind the scenes to kind of get over that kind of stuff. Um, the content is generally graded, and there'll be papers and stuff that has to be due, and your, your instructor gives individualized feedback in addition to the feedback in the discussion. So in the general sense, you get discussion feedback, but in, in the more personal section, you should get some feedback on your individual um, assignments. Um, usually all the communication is electronic in this kind of a case. 
Um, now keep in mind, th this class is a little bit different because we're working with specific software. So I want to start with some general advice for you today. Um, first, when you first start jumping in Blackboard, if you've never done it before, you have to be patient with yourself because the truth is it's not very logical, it's counterintuitive, it changes a lot. Um, and, and so what happens is some people go into the discussion and they, excuse me, they go into Blackboard, they see so much complexity and they totally start freaking out. Um, but again, it's one of those things you just got to play with it a little bit. The more you play with it, kind of like when you're, lose, when you're learning a new word processor such as Microsoft Word, the more you use it, the better it will be. So if you haven't used Blackboard, think of this class as kind of an introduction tutorial to, to show you how to navigate around this kind of stuff. Um, if, because the technical issues are so problematic, I actually made a navigation video for Blackboard. Uh, it changes a little bit because, again, the course is constantly being tweaked. But if you want to watch that navigation video, just search my name, James Lotech, on YouTube, and you will find the video there, too. Uh, there are some videos from some of the, uh, the physical classes, too. If you want to really learn some things, I would watch those. But, again, I, I'm not assigning anything like that to you. It's up to you. It's completely at your discretion. So be patient with yourself. You're not going to learn it all on the first day. There's going to be a lot of reading uh, and there's a lot of redundancy. But again, the way the course was set up, there's really nothing that any professor can do because, again, we're pretty much stuck with what we have, too. Um, so be patient. The next thing is procrastinators. I'm watching you. In, in this class, especially with Blackboard, it, you're not free to just kind of come in the class whenever you want. It's, you actually have deadlines and things that are due every week. So in this sense, Blackboard is kind of different than a normal online class in that it's kind of like set pace. The good thing is if, as long as you keep up with pace, you'll get stuff done. Uh, but the bad thing is kind of harder on, on some of you because I know I, I am you. I'm ex-military. I know what it's like. You guys are very busy and you don't always have the time. Some of you had kids. You got to navigate that extra time. Um, but again, it is what it is and you know we can't control over that. But don't procrastinate because what, what tends to happen, I, I, I see it all the time. If somebody stops, doesn't do any of their work in the first week, they pretty much never catch up. And a lot of times they end up just failing the class for whatever reason or just dropping out. And again, I, I don't want that to happen to you. So again, be active, jump in, start playing with it, and just get stuff done. And don't be afraid to email me because that's what I'm here for too. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. I do want to talk also about some problems with the technology for Mac users and some file compatibility problems. Because sometimes, unfortunately, Macs, they don't always work well with the Blackboard systems, and sometimes things might not open properly on a Mac. Um, so in those cases, what I try to do is I try to send out copies via email so that at least I know if, you, if I send it to you via email, you'll get it. But again, I can't do it for everybody, so if you are having a problem, at least let me know. Um, the other problem is file compatibility because some people like to use the free word processors and stuff. Keep in mind, Blackboard was designed for mainstream processors, so avoid the Google Docs and stick with Microsoft Word. I don't like some of the stuff that Microsoft done, but it's the top dog, and the nice thing about it is it'll work. Another reason to use the Microsoft uh, Word processor pro the program is because many of the tools that are in there will help you with like for example uh, spelling errors grammatical errors and what happens to many people is they turn in assignments they they create it in Google Docs and they don't they think it's perfect but when I open it up on my computer with with uh, Word all the errors just blow up on the screen and the immediate thought comes to my mind is you are so lazy you can't hit right click and correct your spelling and you don't want that to happen. So again, you know, learn to use the standard processors as much, or word processors and so forth and technology as much as possible. I know free is nice, but again, it's, it's cheap enough you can get Office for what, what, $79 for four years. So there's really no uh, reason to not do that. <clears throat> okay, now a little bit more about the Blackboard. And again, I know that the navigation is going to be difficult for many of you. The way a Blackboard works, um, there's two panes, and this is just a general introduction. Read my tutorial for more advanced stuff. There's one pane on the left that's kind of like the main navigation, and you'll have like a week one, a week two, a week three tab, or a little uh, area on the left that you, a button you can click, and you'll have your announcements and so forth within that. Um, <clears throat> 
the, the, the way the lectures are designed is every class opens up and, and there's something that's called a task list that you'll have to check out. And this task list tells you what you have to do every week. Because again, if you try to navigate within Blackboard logically, you'll, you'll be totally lost, right? Um, keep in mind also that Blackboard is constantly getting tweaks. They keep changing the course, and a lot of times they never tell us as we're instructing stuff. So if something changes, sometimes we're not even, uh, we don't even know. So if you have problems with something, just email us and let us know so we can find out, especially because sometimes they make errors when they update the course as well. And, and again, it's very hard for us to detect everything that they do. So again, report those errors. Now, generally how to use Blackboard, uh, uh, excuse me, Blackboard. Uh, generally there's something called announcements and I tend to send many of these announcements out so there's a, a button on the left hand side that you can click for announcements and I would generally start there um, you'll have to scroll down because the older material is done first and you'll see many different postings that I do for the announcements so the announcements are me as an instructor trying to give you guidance on how to navigate this stuff because again I know it's very complex so always read those announcements in those emails because much of the teaching that I do is in there because again I cannot change content I can only do extra kind of stuff right so once you read all the announcements the the oldest ones first and again these will be emailed to you once the course opens up um, then you have to start with each week as a plan and so what you do is for example for the first week you click on the week one button to the left and you'll see on the right hand a pane opens up with all the materials that are for that week one. Once you open up the week one on the right hand side you will see something called the weekly schedule and task list. Uh, it's a document that opens up when you click it. This is the main guide that tells you step by step every day what you must be doing to get everything done. And again sometimes it's three pages you know and I, there's a lot of stuff in it but it'll tell you this is what you have to read then once you read this then you do this this you do on Monday this you do on Tuesday so that is your guide for everything um, now I do send out a short version email to kind of orient you for the week and I hope that helps you and, and I think many students like it a lot um, but again it's not the guide the actual task list is what you must do every day so what happens is you have to search within week one underneath the task list link itself for all the different materials that you'll have. So sometimes you're going to have to scroll down to see everything in that, in that main area. Um, again, one of the major tools of Blackboard is something called the discussion board. The discussion board, and one of the things I like, is it can be accessed by clicking the left discussion on the left side of the screen. You don't have to go just by the week although it's in the week two. Um, but basically what a discussion board is, there'll be a certain thing that you'll have to answer, a question that you'll have to respond to. Um, for example, you're gonna talk about what kind of paper project that you wanna work on and so forth. And the discussion is designed to get the maximum feedback from all your peers, because the truth is, as a professor, I don't know everything. But you know what, every class has about 30 to 35 students and you guys are smart too and you have a lot of experience in different things so what you do in a discussion is bring your knowledge to bear to help that person or respond to that person to make them a better academic right generally again this is supposed to be an academic discussion so don't make it folksy what I would suggest is that you write the discussion responses in Microsoft Word so they're properly formatted Use a citation or two when, when it's required, when, it, when, it's, when it's actually helpful to your cause. And this shows your professor that you're actually going to that step, that you're really understanding the materials. And it helps everybody learn better from each other. And usually what happens is, as a, as a professor, I moderate all the comments. So I can't like comment on every single thing that's said. But I'll have generalized comments. And then when the, com when the uh, discussion comes to a close, usually I'll have a global discussion talking about more in-depth stuff. And that's where some of the learning comes in. So again, learn from each other and ask questions and so forth. And read my responses to those too. Because again, that's where I can do my, I can't change the content, but I can do responses and discussion for them. 
Um, underneath the discussion board, when you when you click on the uh, week one, you'll see stuff like uh, assignments, workshop activities, and so forth. And again, those are things you just have to play with it. So when you, when your task list says do assignment one, you're going to have to scroll down and find assignment one within one of those groupings and open it. Once you open the first that assignment, it'll tell you how it's graded and, and then what to do. Again, so again, you have to play with it to actually find it. And again, I can't help how that works. One of the things that is, I have found helpful is I use the nap the. Uh, the grade center to find stuff that hasn't been done and usually all my grading that's that's where I do my grading because sometimes people think that they had turned stuff in or completed assignments when in reality they did not um, so go use that grade center to check your status throughout the class and make sure you're getting to points because if if you're not you're gonna want to follow up with and find out why this wasn't graded now keep in mind some things like discussions I can't grade until everybody's got stuff posted and so that kind of limits my the way I grade stuff and just it is what it is and I can't help that um, the next thing I want to talk about is how feedback ha happens in this class again first thing in the discussion forum generally take your feedback from your peers but again that's just you know sometimes it's a bunch of people that really don't understand what they're supposed to be doing they're just kind of BS in their way through it frankly right not all the time but sometimes that's what happens in a discussion and my role is to try to bring it back to an academic focus and I try to give you practical advice at various points because some of these assignments are actually pretty good. Um, and then within every individual assignment that you'll post, like for example, after week one Sunday night, you're going to be posting something called the project introduction. I will give every student individualized feedback on that particular assignment, right? So I'll have general feedback for the class and specific feedback for you because and that's for your eyes only um, but one of the things I want you to realize is that when I give feedback I don't do it just in the remarks I might have a few remarks or two you actually have to open the document to see all the highlights and all the different comments that I have in it because these are usually very extensive by me and again I don't always agree with some of the stuff in the course and I'll and I'll give you that practical advice in because I want to get you to be better researchers so Look for the discussion feedback, read the emails that I get. Usually I send those out through announcements. And again, email me at jameslowtech at gmail.com. I have my phone with me all the time, so I'm really good at getting back to students when they have questions and so forth, and that's what I'm here for. Uh, now, in this class, you're going to be writing an analysis paper. Keep in mind that what happened in the online version of the class is it was designed by people in the humanities. It wasn't really designed for a scientific focus, which is what information literacy was originally intended for. So you'll see that they had the, you do in certain class topics. They, they actually have a list of topics that you can do. One of the things that I do is I give you flexibility because the truth is, if you don't care about a paper topic, you're not going to do very well and you're not going to have any interest in it. My advice to you is try to find a scientific type topic that can help you. For example, say for, with the COVID uh, effect on, on small businesses, for example, probably there's going to be some uh, peer-reviewed literature starting to develop about how to respond by, by businesses to COVID. For example, if I have a restaurant, I would try to find out what are the top three ways that I can reduce the effects of the spread of COVID. And you, so you can search the scientific literature and make a paper on that. And if you have the restaurant, guess what? You can implement some of those changes based on real science instead of all this stuff and the bickering that you're seeing on TV, right? <clears throat> so again, try to find a topic that you care about. Another example, many students have, like, they, say, for example, you have a child with autism. You love your child. But, you know, autism is a very complicated thing. It's a huge range of problems. And sometimes finding the best therapy for your particular child is problematic. And you don't always want to rely on experts because they could be wrong. You know your child. So you could, for example, compare and contrast two or three different treatments for autism. And then you can try to analyze it in terms of how that will help your ch particular child. So all of a sudden, you, when you're doing research, and if you do this right, you're not doing it for no reason. And what I would also suggest in every future class, always do a paper on something that you care about like this. 
For example, if because I've known many people that graduated with degrees that are dumb as doorknobs. They didn't learn anything in any of these classes because the research shows that after about six months, 90% of everything you learn is gone. That's not helpful. But think of it this way. If every single class you want to be a nurse, that you do a specific research on another aspect of nursing, by the time you're done with your bachelor's, you won't be somebody that just says, hire me, I got a degree, I'm cute. It doesn't work. Now you'll speak their language and you can solve their problems. And that's how you're supposed to use college to actually monetize it. Because uh, again, there's many degrees out there you won't get paid for. And you got, you got to know this going into it. Uh, I hope that helps. But again, I give you the topic flexibility. Still post it on the, in the, on the forums as, as, as that's required. Uh, they may have made some changes. There's a sign-up list, but I don't care about that. Again, I want you to be able to pick your own topic, so don't worry about if they implemented that yet. So pick what your topic is. You don't have to do it just on information technology. Do it on something scientific, though. Uh, what you're supposed to do in this class, again, this is a scientific analysis paper. It is not just argument. Uh, one of the problems with the topics that they gave you is they're, they're all pretty much speculation and their arguments. So how can you do a scientific analysis of stuff that's all speculation? So again, for the humanities, they do that. In science, we don't do that. In science, we're, we're going for the facts for a specific purpose. In, in a scientific paper, you start with a problem. Like, like, for example, the problem is I need a better treatment of autism for my children. And at the end of the paper, you want to provide an answer to that. This is going to be the best kind of treatment for my paper. So kind of keep that in the, in the background. Um, the types of scientific analysis that are most, uh, this, this is what I would stick with, either cause and effect paper. That's the, the, probably like 95% of the papers are going to be, be cause and effect. You can do comparison contrast. Uh, note that that's not pro and con, because pro and con is all argument, right? So everybody can have their own opinions. Scientifically, it's a little bit different. Uh, you can do a process paper, you can do an extended definition paper, or you can do a classification paper. And again, you can watch some of my YouTube videos to, for the other class to kind of see what some of those are, or look them up yourself, because um, I, I can't give you too much more details in there, but that's what I would stick with. Finally, what I'm going to do for you, because again, I, I hate when people throw me into a glass and they just kind of make me swim. And I know that the way this class was designed, it, it is kind of like that, but I can't help it. So what, what I'm going to do is along the way, I'm going to send you sample papers from other students. And you can use these as templates to start your own work. And that way, hopefully, you'll have a better output product. So when it comes time to writing your paper, I'll send you a sample paper. I'll send you instructions, and you'll get lots more details. So more of the learning is going to be coming through just reading the course materials. It's going to be through the information that I provide to you, too. Now, I think I've chatted you up for long enough. I know that you have a lot to do this week. Welcome to the class. Uh, I would start with, you know, go ahead and introduce yourself on the discussions, and then read all the announcements. Follow the instructions within those announcements and get right into the task list from week one. Um, again, my name is James Lotech, and it's nice to meet y'all, so to speak. You have a nice night.